We had an incredible Lent this year. We spent the last six weeks talking about all the things in life we didn't see coming. Things that were hard, things that were surprising, things that put us on a different life course. And we talked about the things that broke us. Interestingly, we realize that we tend to forget the good things we didn't expect, but we remember most clearly those things which came out of nowhere and almost took us down. The followers of Jesus who are the main characters in the Eastern narrative that comes from the Gospel of Luke hadn't seen any of the events of the previous week coming. In the span of those few days, they had watched the world they knew destroyed. And coming to the tomb that morning, they were grieving an unimaginable loss. That would have been enough all on its own. But when they arrived at the tomb, they found the body of Jesus had been taken. I feel pretty certain that would have been enough to push any of us over the edge. I've always wished that one of the gospel writers had written about the conversation the women were having on the way to the tomb in depth. I don't think it was idle chit chat. I would bet they were talking about their feelings of pain and grief and anger and loss. Their future had changed forever. But were they already thinking about what would come next? Could they settle back into their old lives? Would they go back to the way things had been before? Or would grief keep their hearts torn open from that time forward? In their world, oppression and death were dealt out as if it were normal by an empire that couldn't have cared less. It didn't matter if you were hungry or without work or living on the streets. It didn't matter if you had a mental disability or a treatable disease. It didn't matter if you were innocent of a crime you didn't commit or if you were seeking justice against an unjust regime. So maybe the people had just gotten used to death. Maybe they'd been, become numb to disappointment. Maybe they lived with those feelings of despair every single day. Living as they did, they rightly expected to see death when they went to that tomb. Death was not unfamiliar to them. And while we would never admit that we might have become numb to things that are dead all around us, we may have become comfortable seeing it play out day in and day out. So comfortable that we forget to look for anything that is living among the dead. Anything that would awaken in us a deeper spark of life that would change us and our world for the rest of our lives. I was writing liturgy for our Holy Week services on Monday as Notre Dame burned. I was listening to the Fare Requiem that would be presented on Good Friday, and the combination of that live coverage and that music was holy and hellish all at the same time. I couldn't stop thinking about the generations of craftsmen and families who had given so much to build that cathedral. It was the legacy of so many. I finally had to quit watching and listening. It was too much. And then I didn't want to see any of the pictures or watch any of the news coverage. I didn't want to see the destruction. I was afraid it was a total loss. I was expecting to see absolutely nothing hopeful, just like those women at the tomb. But after the fire was extinguished, photos began appearing that told a different story. The towers were intact. The organ, Christoph, was not destroyed. The rose windows were still there and the beehives and the bees survived. And a cross on the altar was still standing. Amidst the damage of a fallen roof of charred wood stood a cross, a bright cross in the 
the space filled with broken pieces and ashes. I kept looking at one picture that showed that bright, beautiful cross, and suddenly I was reminded of the Japanese art that repairs pottery with gold or silver lacquer. When something is broken, the artists take the broken pieces and rather than throwing them away, they use precious metals to put them back together again. They use precious metals to repair them. It would have been hard for those women to believe that their lives were going to change. They might not have been able to hear what the Japanese believe, which is that the peace is more beautiful now for having been broken. But when those dazzling two showed up, I just love thinking about those dazzling two. When they showed up at that tomb, they were not going to let those women leave until they began the restoration process of their own brokenness. Those dazzling two must have been absolutely amazing. So think Beyonce at Coachella. The dazzling two must have been so convincing. Think Pete Buttigieg when he went up against those odious, we are for God, not gays, people at his Iowa rally. The dazzling two must have seen life after death before. Think the God of the universe in all its glory. Now they didn't tell the women they shouldn't grieve or cry or be angry at what had happened. No, they simply asked them to remember what Jesus had said. They simply asked them to remember how Jesus lived. They simply asked them to remember what and who Jesus lived for. Jesus had spent so much time bringing life from death in those backwater places where the Romans were squashing people like they were ants. But the dazzling too said the spirit of life will never succumb to the forces of death, not even when Romans or any other power that oppresses people think they have won the day. Then those two dazzling ones said to them, Stop looking for the living among the dead. Stop. My mother took that scripture to an extreme. She hated cemeteries. And she always told us, after she died, not to bother coming. She wasn't going to be there. Don't waste money on flowers. It's ridiculous. So... For a lot of years after her death, I hated cemeteries too. And then I think I've told you one time about this particular cemetery that we moved near in Virginia. It was absolutely the perfect place for morning walks each and every day. And because it was the perfect place and there was no other perfect place, I had to pull myself together and say, I may not like cemeteries, but I'm gonna walk in this cemetery. And you know, one good thing about walking in a cemetery, it dramatically increases the speed of your steps. It's a much better workout. It took me a while to stop walking as fast as I possibly could. It took me a while to slow down and start reading the headstones, dating from the early 1700s right up to the ones who had been placed so recently. I didn't start looking for the living among the dead exactly. Although, I did think that I saw a couple of ghosts on a regular basis. But I did begin to imagine what life might have come from their deaths. So many of the graves were family plots where you could see generation after generation of families. I began realizing 
that these were the people who built a nation. These were the people who believed in the idea of being equal. I started looking around at this wonderful little burg that we lived in 50 miles from Washington, a place where George Washington actually had slept. I started appreciating the trees that they planted hundreds of years ago, the trees that still brought shade and delight. I looked at the houses they had built all over this little town. Houses that had been home for family after family after family. And I started wondering what they must have done to go from the brokenness of the Revolutionary War and the War of 1812, the First World War, the epidemic of the Spanish flu, the Great Depression, World War II, and all the storms and trials of everyday ordinary life. How did they manage to find life from death? Because there was no way that death bypassed them. I walked through that evidence every day. I've come to believe that we are all capable of finding life in the midst of death. But we have to want to see a future coming from the ashes and the ruins. And we have to be committed to looking and listening to the ones like the dazzling two who come and tell us, no matter what, life persists. The spirit of Christ is present and it will always and forever be. And it will always and forever keep calling us to find that life that comes from death. Those who had spread the faith of Jesus rose from those ashes. They believed those dazzling too, so much so that they faced opposition throughout their lifetimes just to make sure we all knew there is and always will be life from death. And the beauty that came from their brokenness still exists in the beauty of this cathedral and this congregation in our time. Like the women who were at the cross and who came to that tomb early in the morning, we are not standing alone. In this place, we belong to each other. And together, we will walk into a bright future, one that is bright with hope and with love. Today, I'm choosing hope and love because I believe our best days are ahead of us. And if First Church is new to you today, we invite you to come and be part of everything that is happening here. We invite you to walk into the future with us. Because together, we're gonna to help our city and each other find the life that comes from death. May it be so. May it be so for us. Amen.